Bokiaro et al., 2012, Disobedience and Whistleblowing. Background. Bokiaro et al. were interested in studying the process of disobedience between individuals and authority, and the extent to which people will become whistleblowers when dealing with an unethical request. Whistleblowing is a term that describes the act of reporting wrongdoings, in a legal or ethical sense, in relation to an organisation, group of people, or an individual. An example could be if someone were to find out that a business was stealing customers' money as a part of a scam. Once they found out, they might become a whistleblower by reporting it to the police. In particular, the researchers wanted to build upon the study into obedience by Milgram, which had concluded that people have, quote, strong inclinations to obey legitimate authority, irrespective of their beliefs, feelings, or intentions. Aim. Bacchiaro et al. sought to answer a number of key questions. Who are the people that disobey or blow the whistle? Why do they choose that challenging moral path? What are they thinking at that decisive moment? And do they have personal characteristics that differentiate them from those who obey? Sample. The study consisted of two main samples. The first were a group of 138 undergraduate students at the VU University in Amsterdam who were simply asked to predict results of the study. The second main sample consisted of 149 undergraduate students at the VU University in Amsterdam, including 96 women and 53 men, and the average age of participants was 20.8 years old. This group were the participants who took part in the main part of this study. Both groups of samples were recruited via volunteer sampling, responding to flyers posted in the university campus cafeteria. Methodology the study took place in a laboratory, although there was no independent variable, so it's more accurate to describe it as a controlled observation. The dependent variables of the study consisted of two main parts. Firstly, whether a participant obeyed, disobeyed, or blew the whistle. And secondly, participant scores on two personality inventories. The first, which is known as a hexaco PIR, which measures six dimensions of the personality, including honesty, humility, emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience, and the second of which is known as the social value orientation, or SVO for short, which measures whether people are generally more individualistic or pro-social in their preferences for the outcomes of social situations. In other words, whether people are more concerned with their self-interest or the interests of others. Procedure. As mentioned earlier, the first sample in the study, consisting of 138 students, were told about the true nature of the study, and were asked two questions. What would you do? And what would an average student at your university do? The second sample of 149 students took part in the main part of the study. Each participant took part in the study individually. Firstly, they were told they had the right to withdraw, and were guaranteed that their results would be confidential. They were then introduced to the experimenter, who was male, dressed in formal clothing, and had a stern, imposing manner which suggested that he was a person of authority. After asking the participants to provide some names of fellow students, which was seemingly unjustified, the experimenter provided a cover story about what the study was about, which was different from the true nature of the study. The story was as follows. Along with an Italian colleague, I am investigating the effects of sensory deprivation on brain function. We recently conducted an experiment on six participants who spent some time completely isolated, in Rome, unable to see or hear anything. What happened was traumatic. All of those people panicked. Their cognitive abilities were impaired temporarily. Some experienced visual and auditory hallucinations. Two participants even asked us to stop because of their strong symptoms. But we didn't, because such a decision would have implied collecting invalid data. In post-experimental interviews, the majority said that it was a frightening experience. Now our aim is to replicate the study at the VU University, on a sample of college students. There is currently no data on young people, but some scientists think that their brain is more sensitive to the negative effects of isolation. It is difficult to predict what will happen, and I'm worried about that, but I want to go ahead with this experiment. A university research committee is evaluating whether to approve our study. Of course, they have high standards, and know about the great suffering caused by extended sensory deprivation, so I don't know. We will see what their decision is. In the meantime, the committee is collecting information. It seems they do not have a clear idea about what to do. That is why we are also interested in the feedback from students like you, who happen to know details regarding my experiment. You will find the research committee forms in the next room. Having said all that, 
What I need for you is to write a statement to convince the students that you indicated earlier to participate in my sensory deprivation study. We will send them your testimonial through email, and if this is okay, I will contact you in the future for other promotions. So, this means money for you. As you can see, this is a preliminary stage of the experiment, but it is also important to show members of the research committee that people do not negatively judge sensory deprivation. I'll be right back. The experimenter then left the room and stayed out for three minutes in order to provide some time for the participant to reflect on the action-based decisions about to be made. He then returned and continued. Let's move into the next room. There is a computer for you to perform the task. Of course, you must be enthusiastic in writing the statement. To this aim, it is requested that you use at least two adjectives among exciting, incredible, great, and superb. Also, you cannot mention the negative effects of sensory deprivation. Begin your task. I'll be back. The experimenter then left the room and stayed out for a full seven minutes. In the second room, where the participant was now located, there was a mailbox and some research committee forms. If the participant believed that the study proposed by the experimenter on sensory deprivation violated ethical standards, they could anonymously report it by putting a form in the mailbox. After the seven minutes was up, the experimenter returned and invited the participant to follow him back to the first room where they took the two personality inventories, the Hexaco PIR and the social value orientation. The participant was then fully debriefed about the true nature of the study that they had just taken part in. They were informed of the reasons why the researchers deceived them and the purpose of the study, and they were provided with an email address to contact if they wanted to ask further questions about the study or complain. Results. In the first stage of the study, the separate sample of 138 participants were asked to predict what they would do in the study, and also predict what they thought the average student at their university would do. Of all the students, only 3.6% indicated that they thought that they would obey the experimenter. By contrast, 31.9% thought that they would be disobedient, and 64% thought that they would whistleblow. In relation to how they thought an average student at the university would react, 18.8% of participants predicted that they would obey, 43% thought that they would disobey, and 37% thought other students would whistleblow. However, the second main part of the study produced a very different set of results. Out of the sample of 149 students, 76.5% obeyed the experimenter, 14.1% disobeyed, and only 9.4% of participants blew the whistle. Of the participants who were whistleblowers, 6% had actually written a statement as the experimenter had asked, and were therefore classed as anonymous whistleblowers, since the experimenter wouldn't have known that they were not obedient. The remaining 3.4% of whistleblowers had refused to write a statement, and were therefore classed as open whistleblowers. The researchers also analysed the results from the two personality inventories to find out whether there were any social or personality factors that influenced participants' behaviour. No significant differences were found in relation to gender or religious affiliation. However, a significant difference was found in relation to faith, which, in the context of this study, was defined as belief in transcendent reality. The researchers identified that there seemed to be a trend, which suggested that whistleblowers had more faith compared to obedient and disobedient participants. Similarly, there were no significant differences in any of the six personality factors measured by the Hexaco PIR personality inventory, and it was also determined that pro-social and individualistic participants were not equally distributed amongst whistleblowers, obedient participants, or disobedient participants. Researchers also obtained some qualitative data from participants about their thought process during the study. Obedient participants justified their behaviour by reallocating their responsibility to external forces. Some of their comments included, It was expected of me, that's why I continued. I cooperated because the experimenter asked me to. And, that was the task, so I executed it. In contrast, the disobedient participants felt that they were fully responsible for their own actions, their comments included, I don't want to do unethical things. I would be very disappointed in myself. I disobeyed because I felt responsible towards my friends. And, if the study would really hurt people, I wouldn't want to be responsible for that. Participants who were disobedient, and those who decided to whistleblow, 
provided insights about how it was the fact that they were told by the experimenter that they weren't allowed to include references to any negative effects of sensory deprivation in their statement, which led them to defy the experimenter. Some of their comments included, I did not see harm in writing the message, but leaving out the negative info was unacceptable to me. I was fine until I read that the negative consequences would not be mentioned. Then I did not feel good. My decision to blow the whistle was influenced by demand to leave out the negative consequences in the message. Conclusions There were a number of conclusions that the researchers had after their study. The first main conclusion, from the first stage of the study, where 64.5% of participants had predicted that they would be whistleblowers, seemed to confirm the idea that many people believe their behaviour in relation to authority is mostly guided by their own moral principles, and are free to act rationally and not be obedient to the influence of authority that might contradict those moral principles. Moreover, the data also suggested that most people tend to project their beliefs in their own moral robustness onto other people, perceiving that there is generally a consensus of moral choices and behaviour amongst the population as a whole. However, the results from the second, main part of the study provided this consensus to be false. People are in fact overwhelmingly likely to obey figures of authority, even if the request is unethical. And they are also explicit in justifying their immoral behaviour by attributing personal responsibility to external forces. The researchers commented that it was, quote, an easy way of escape for an unexpected and conflictual situation, and a way of preserving their belief that they are moral despite their actions. The researchers also commented on the fact that the situation presented to the participants in the study mostly generated the same outcome for everyone, regardless of their individual differences, for example, gender or religious affiliation, suggesting that none of the differences have any bearing on whether someone is more likely to be obedient, disobedient, or a whistleblower. Overall, the researchers concluded that the findings clearly showed that behaving in a moral manner in the face of authority is challenging for people despite the notion of acting morally appearing to be the easiest path to follow from the perspective of an observer. The researchers postulated that, quote, when people are confronted with demands they perceive as unjust, the question is not whether to obey an authority or not. The choice that matters is which authority to obey, the one making the demand or the one that would disapprove of the resulting actions. It is eventually a matter of hierarchy. Evaluations. The fact that the research was undertaken as a controlled observation enabled the researchers to control any confounding variables, which therefore increases the internal validity of the study. However, this also reduced the ecological validity of the study somewhat, since the participants knew that they were being observed, which could have therefore induced an observer bias or other form of demand characteristics in participants. Also, the fact that the researchers used standard personality inventories to identify individual differences and traits in participants enhanced the replicability of the study, since other researchers can reliably produce this. In terms of ethics, the researchers made some good steps to ensure the welfare of participants before, during and after the study. They were guaranteed that their participation would be kept confidential and received a full debrief after the study ended. Researchers also provided with a means of contacting them after the study to ask any further questions or provide any complaints. A possible negative ethical consideration is the fact that participants were placed into a distressing situation, with many obeying a request which was unethical. One part of the study in particular had a personal element to it, when the experimenter asked participants to provide names of fellow students, which meant the potential victims of their obedience were not anonymous other people, but their own friends and fellow students. It's not inconceivable that this may have introduced some self-doubt in participants about their own personal loyalties and trust in relation to their friends and peers. The participants in the study were recruited via volunteer sample, consisting of students from a university in the Netherlands. Therefore, it could be argued that it's not totally representative of a wider population, aka cultural bias. However, the fact that participants were all volunteers provided researchers with a quick, convenient and cheap method of getting people to participate in the study, compared with other sampling methods such as random sampling, which can be more costly and time-consuming.